Joey, I was having a conversation today with a guy, we'll just call him John. And he was telling me, he said, man, I, I had been working for, I don't know, 15 years and didn't have a whole lot of money to show for it. Had built a, you know, a family that I was spending more and more time away from than I was with and has, was starting to get a little discouraged because I didn't see a pathway out. And he said, and then on your podcast, I heard a guy who talked about how to, to build short-term rental business without even having to buy real estate, but with just the ability to rent the real estate. He said, that was my moment. That was my breaking point. That was the clarity that I needed in order to push me to start building streams of passive income. Now this guy has built a number of passive income streams, is on a completely different trajectory, and is taking trips with his family and never had the ability even to dream about doing. And today's podcast, Joey, is about breaking down short-term rentals as a passive income option. And if that doesn't get you cited, I don't know what does, Dave. <laughs> well, maybe you've been waiting on the sidelines because you're like, yeah, that just sounds too good to be true. It sounds too difficult. Today, we're breaking down the pros and the cons, right? And the tactical ways to find short-term rentals, how to acquire them, and, and lastly, how to operate them. So if you've been waiting on those sort of details, that's what today's podcast is all about. And you're getting to hear from us and all the coaches who have personally done this ourselves. So this is not just fluff. This is tactical. I say we stop all the talk and we get to the table and we bail you up. Welcome to the Wealth Without Wall Street podcast, your guide to understanding how to get out of the Wall Street rat race and start your own mailbox money lifestyle. Now, don't let these handsome Southern draws fool you. These financial minds are teaching our country to enhance savings, increase cash flow, and create passive income, all without the help of Wall Street. Are you ready to break through? Now, here are your hosts, Russ Morgan and Joey Murray. Welcome into the Financial Freedom Roundtable, where each week we break down complex financial topics so that you can more easily understand them, and more importantly, take action on your path to becoming financially free. Is this your first time joining us? Welcome. Grateful to have you in the room. I'm Russ Morgan. They call me the idea guy. Mostly because bad internet guy just didn't sound so good to me. But enough about me for a moment. Let me introduce you to my co-host, my partner. He's the Italian stallion. He's got the license plate cover to prove it. Mr. Joe Amire. Stallion, good afternoon. Yes, sir. Happy to be here. I see you um, brushing that mane, man. What you working on over there? I mean, the stallion's got to keep it, you know, keep it tame. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, bro, today we are breaking down short-term rentals, something that you and I have talked about a lot on this show. We live in a shared economy, man. For better or worse, we also live on these social channels. I think, Joey, that this may be the most important passive income strategy we could talk about because it may be the most accessible strategy to building passive income out there. Agree? Disagree? I I do think it is one of those. Um, I think it's the wave of the future ultimately. And it's, it's really changed the game. Uh, if you're like, even like a looking into real estate right now, you may be put off by high interest rates. You may be put off by the fact that prices keep going up. Well, one of the only strategies, in my opinion, that is outrunning those things is the short-term rental space because the they keep paying higher and higher rents on these short-term uh, you know, stays and things that will outpace those things and continue to give you more and more cash flow, which as we know, you want to have more cash flow to create a, a passive income that exceeds your monthly expenses. And this is one of the shortest routes to get there. Okay. All right. Well, That's my take. I, I I appreciate your take, bro. I, but thankfully, it's not the only take, man. Yes. We're, we're joined by the dream team of financial coaches. Speaking of dream, I got the king of Beham right here. Mr. Real Estate himself. He's agnostic to his type as long as it produces cash flow. The multi-talented Jamie O'Brien. Good to see you, Jamie. 
Man, good to be here, Russ. Appreciate you having me. Yeah, man. Why do you think this topic is so important for us to talk about right now? And I think there's several reasons. The one I think we focus on for me today is, is we talk a lot about the formula for financial freedom. That's passive income being greater than your monthly expenses. And I know firsthand, and I think we all know that short-term rentals can provide great cash flow if they're done correctly. So if that's the goal, I think this is super important to talk about this. I think that the virtual work environment is here to stay, but I think you need to do it correctly. Mm. That's a by good way, caveat to add, by the way, done correctly is important. <laughs> and if, if you're not watching our podcast, you're missing out on some significant fashion between the two high eyes in the room. <laughs> Jamie and myself are kicking off a little pink today. Hey, you just got to you got to show it out every once in a while. Stand out, <laughs> right? Yeah, I want that attention. I love it. All right. Let's get over to your right. I got the piano man. We're all in the mood for passive income, and you have a C in the light, Mr. Matthew Hammond. Welcome back, Matthew. Uh, it's good to be back, Russ. Thank you. Hey, tell me, why is it important for us to be covering this topic and breaking down the short-term rental income um, as a passive income strategy? Well, let me tell you, before I get into that, I, I want to say that this topic it has a special place in my heart because this short-term rentals in combination with, with infinite banking were the springboard that got me on my financial freedom journey. And if it were not for short-term rentals and, and infinite banking, I literally would not be sitting here right now talking to you. So, uh, so I have to emphasize how, how, how excited I am to talk about this topic. Now, as far as the importance of this topic, just like Jamie said, short-term rentals, the cash flow is absolutely significant, but there's so many other benefits as we all know to owning real estate. And there's actually one special benefit to owning short-term rentals. And that is if you are a W-2 employee and you feel like uh, the IRS is taking too much money out of your paycheck, every paycheck, and um, and you have no idea how to mitigate that, short-term rentals may be the answer to your problems. Oh, I'm going to have to dig into that in a second. Hey, Stallion, you hear him give us that diving reference, the springboard. Mm. You know, whenever you and I looked at doing this business in May of 2020, I felt like we may be jumping off a high dive. <laughs> like, With you know, no water. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we may have jumped before knowing how much water was in the pool, right? That's 100 percent for sure. All right. Let, I, lo I love the fact that Matthew is a result of this strategy being implemented and getting him to this point like that you and i did it as like a, hey this would be great let's let's build something on the side this literally changed his whole trajectory so i think that's awesome to have him on a hundred percent well let, let's put some um some shirt on this thing here right a, a little clothes not shirt in, in alabama shirt could be clothes right for some people but i'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a uh a, a little bit of a framework guys so the first thing I think we need to cover is how one would find a short-term rental. Because I think that that's a question that immediately comes up. Am I in the right place to do it? Do I have to go somewhere else to do it? There's a lot of lot of room there for us to talk on, but also talk about what to watch out for, right? The second point I would love for us to talk about is how do we acquire them? Not all of us on this call are really interested in buying the real estate. Some of us are interested in only arbitrage in it, and some yeah. of us are looking for whatever one will cash flow. <laughs> the Amen. last point, the, the last point, the third point is how do we operate it? Because there's so many little details in there, as somebody said earlier on, that we need to operate this correctly. And I think too oftentimes the fear of the unknown prevents us maybe from getting into this space. So I'd love for us to break down all of those things, the M's, the management, the the marketing, um, the automation, the team members, right? Lots of stuff. I thought there was three M's, by the way. Looks like it was just M&M's. Like, who doesn't two. like, two two. like M&M's? Come on. All right. All right. So I'm, I'm coming to you, Jamie. I want, I want to talk right. a little bit about finding the property. You've got a short-term rental. How did you find your property? Man, I found the property uh, just like I find all my other properties. I, I focus mainly here in Birmingham. I, I saw this property. What I did first was get educated about short-term rentals. 
And I found a property that I knew that I could, I had multiple options with this is probably getting into a different piece, but I found a property that I wanted to rehab. And then I started looking at the market around me to figure out if it could be a short-term rental property. And so I did my research and then, um, turned it into a short-term rental and it's been great ever since. So, you know, for me, it was understanding Birmingham, knowing what Birmingham had to offer, knowing what that specific property had to offer within Birmingham. Um, hmm. So that's kind of what I looked at when I was considering making my property a short-term rental. So you were looking more for like a destination, right? Like you're thinking all these people that are going to travel to Birmingham, you know, as a as, as their like anniversary trip, may, maybe even a honeymoon, right? Like this is like what had you interested in the Birmingham market for short-term rentals? No, not at all. Not at all. Actually, <laughs> I knew people came to Birmingham and I knew that that people came to stay. Um, I've had such a weird mix of, of guests. It's been great. Um, for me, it was it was purely uh, it was a little bit accidental, to be totally honest with you. But, you know, where the property sat, I knew we were close to downtown. I knew Birmingham has a great concert scene, a yeah, great food scene and a great healthcare scene. So I knew people were coming to town and uh, you know, tried it out. It, to be honest, Stanley, I didn't think anybody dr- came to Birmingham. I was thinking, what in the world? What are you saying? Same, here? same, same. And that's right? when we when we turned my long term rental into a short term rental. Is the only time I was convinced because, to be honest, I was like, oh yeah, well that's great that so and so you know turned on a short term rental and he had good results or she had good results. I'm like, I don't think it's going to work here in Birmingham, but can't hurt to try. Right. We just maybe we lose some money on some furniture. And just try. Yeah, exactly. Just try. And we tried. And 30 days later, I was a believer because the revenue on that one unit tripled what I had normally been uh, capable of being able to get on a long term rental basis. Did you say tripled? Triple. What does that mean? That means I went from being able to make nine hundred fifty dollars a month revenue to almost $3,000 in that same month. Wow. Okay. It was crazy. So ours was accidental too, right? I I owned one and flipped it over to short-term rental. But as far as finding one, if we're still on that topic, uh, I want to share that experience. Let me get over to Matthew first. Pianamine, was yours accidental and did you stay local? No and no. So ours was definitely intentional. And, uh, so, so we, my wife and I, we, we were listening to your podcast actually, and you interviewed Avery Carl with the short term shop and, uh, they were a real estate agency that actually specializes in short term rentals and they only specialized in destination markets. And my wife, Angie and I, we looked at each other and said, that's it. If we're going to buy a short term rental, we're going to buy in a place that we want to visit. We want to buy in a place that we want a vacation. You know, people use Turo to buy a liability, buy that car that they normally under normal circumstances would never be able to buy and let somebody else pay for it so that they can enjoy the car when they want to. But we wanted to use that same philosophy for our vacation homes. So we picked a destination starting out in the mountains that we love going to the mountains. And we uh, we decided to purchase a cabin in, uh, in Pigeon Forge because we love going to that destination. And not only not only were we able to purchase that vacation home, but we were able to purchase it and let somebody else pay for it. And you know, as far as I'm concerned, that is the absolute best of both worlds. I love that. You know, here's the thing: when you're looking for short-term rentals, there is that local market. You can be serving people who are coming into town for work, who are coming into town for event venues, like you mentioned, Jamie. Like I just went to see Hamilton here in town and I, I just stayed in line. I met a lot of people from out of town, right? Who were driving in. Our show was at eight o'clock. It was in and at 11. My guess is a lot of those people were not driving two, three, four hours back to where they came from. They were staying somewhere locally and a condo apartments near and downtown is always a, an attractive feature because you get some of those extra benefits that you don't get in a hotel. But also there's other options, right? There's in addition to going into a vacation area like the mountains or the beach or the lake, I see people who are setting up farmhouses. I see people like Stallion who's renting um, these 
What's the pull behind trailer? The, the the little silver thing called stallion that you stayed up in uh, Chattanooga. The airstream. The airstream. Running airstreams. See people doing uh, tree houses. Tree houses. Right? We yeah. have we had a, we have a guy speak that our past income mastermind last year when we were in Austin, Texas. He created like a a storage unit that he put on stilts in, on a farm, and people come and rent it because they're trying to get the tree house experience. For sure. I mean, who doesn't want to live in a tree house for just a short period of time? I mean, listen, if you go on Airbnb, you will find a giant potato in the middle of Idaho that you can go <laughs> stay in. <laughs> so there's an experience for everyone out there. Trust me. Hey, hey, you know what I'm thinking about? So we're building this lake house stallion and it's not going to be ready until 2024, but I'm going to have a boat house. Right. And it's got this little bitty like a frame top, like second floor. I wonder if I could put that thing on Airbnb this summer and help pay for some of the construction costs. All day long. All day long. <laughs> right. Like water view, like like you could like leap from leap from the window into the water. Like I mean you natural can AC. You know? Yeah. Hundred percent. Right. Like mosquitoes included. I mean, it's a, it's just a beautiful option. All right, here's a couple of things that I want to talk about is what should we watch out for when we are trying to find these units? Because that's, that's a, um, I think, a hesitation for people. Where do I go? Maybe I, I heard you guys say there's local, there's destination, there's vacation. But what about what should I watch out for? Matthew, what would you say? What's one of those items on your list? So I, I'm going to focus more on the destination markets only because that's what I, I'm more familiar with. But but one of the things you want to look out for in destination markets is oversaturation, especially as the short-term rental opportunity becomes more and more popular, more and more properties are becoming short-term rentals in these destination markets. Now, that doesn't mean that it's not it's still not a great market to invest in, but you, you just have to be mindful that your competition is going to be a lot more severe in these these you know, saturated markets. You, you say and saturated. So you want to make how would sure. I, yeah. How would I know if it's saturated? One one good way is to, you know, consult uh, realtors in that area. You can, you can, you can, you can track the market itself, you know, on Zillow, just seeing Zillow or one of these other, other programs um, just to see what kind of, what kind of movement is going on in those particular markets. Um, but realtors are typically your best source. Um, but again, like I said, saturation is not a deal killer. The big thing you just need to be mindful of if you do go one, into one of these markets, especially if your motivations were like mine, where I want to go into the market because I want to visit that market, not just make money in that market, is that you just have to stand out in the crowd. So what you need yeah. to do is you need to look at your enemies, you know, the other renters that are out there in that market, and you need to look and see what they're offering. You know, I would say frenemies. I wouldn't say necessarily enemies. Enemies are a little <laughs> harsh, but, <laughs> but you got to look at the other, you got to look at your competition. And you got to see what they're offering, you know, as far as amenities, as far as, you know, extra, extra little things. And just just make sure that you offer not only those, but even more to stand out in those types of markets. Well, and two, two other things, Matthew, like I'm sure whenever you went to look at your cabin or if you're looking at a condo at the beach or whatever it may be, especially if it's already been on the rental market, you can ask for rent rolls, right? You can ask the management company to provide a historical view of what how this property is performed doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to continue as you mentioned like there may be more units coming on board that are going to you know reduce that but that's a real you know tactical way to ask you know questions and then for us russ i think one of the things that we used was air dna um online it's a you know reservoir of all the different activity that's going on in any specific area and you can you can buy that area that you're looking at, uh, in our case, Birmingham, and and see what's renting, what are they, uh, what's the percentages of occupancy in those areas. And you can, and I think it's been really helpful for us. Whenever we have low occupancy, we can look at that tool and say, is it a problem with us or is it the market? And you can see how do you perform according to the local market. So those are just some practical things. If you've listened to our show for any length of time, you've heard us talk about infinite banking and how we were able to use that concept to create over $50,000 a month in passive income. But it's just not that easy to figure out how does this all connect into my own personal system? Stallion, that's why we created the passive income operating system, bro. It shows you how to turn active income 
into passive income. It makes all the steps come together. If you would like to get access to it as a podcast listener, we've never given this away in public before. Go to whatswhatwallstreet.com forward slash P-I-O-S. There was nothing worse than walking into class when you're in school and the teacher saying, pop quiz day. Why? Because you were unprepared. Are you unprepared, though, for financial freedom? Don't be. Find out how close you are by taking our 30-second quiz at wealthwithoutwallstreet.com forward slash quiz. Yeah, that's a, Air DNA is a good source because it's a good it's a good average for the entire market. One thing you do want to be careful for uh, if you're evaluating individual properties, like if you're looking at a particular property that you're looking to buy, one thing you definitely want to be careful of is putting too much stock in the the revenue that that property brought in under the previous owner or the previous manager. Because not all property managers, not all short term rental uh, managers are are made the same. So even if that property, you know, only says it only brought in, you know, $30,000 last year, there's no reason, depending on what market it is, there's no reason why if you go in there and you put in the effort and you, you put in that extra, that extra effort to, to, to build it up, there's no reason why you couldn't double or even triple that revenue. So you just got to be careful when, when evaluating in that, that way as well. Love it. Jamie, what else do you think we should watch out for when we're trying to look for where we want to put and acquire a, a short-term rental? Well, you've, you've got to know the city ordinances. So uh, unfortunately, short-term rentals have gotten a little bit of a bad name or Airbnbs have gotten a bad name around certain places. So what I've seen is a lot of cities have started cracking down on allowing rentals under 30 days. So if we're going to have a traditional 30-day uh, or less short-term rental Airbnb type property, you really need to know if the city allows those. So I know a girl that her and her husband had um, an outbuilding, an accessory dwelling unit in their backyard in Tuscaloosa. They were renting it on these short-term rental platforms. People were loving it. They spent money to renovate it. It was up and going. They were almost fully booked. And the city has come in and shut them down, told them they can no longer rent that property out. Mm, yeah. Does that sound familiar, Russ? <laughs> we didn't even get that far, but yes, yes, I I, I know uh, city ordinances as well as HOAs, right? Yeah. You need to understand, is there a homeowners association involved, a condo association? A lot of times those associations have no interest in having you in there, one, because whoever the president is, is trying their best to reduce the number of calls and emails they receive on a daily, monthly basis because it's usually not a paid for thing and they don't have any interest of like having, you know, Janice who lives next door to your unit, talk about how people come in and every each and every day. Right. Yeah. So I, I think understanding what to watch out for there. And then last thing I'll, I'll throw into there, whether you're rent, whether you're looking at a condo apartment or house, looking at the, just like any other property you would buy, looking at the breakable items, the the items, the use items, because when you put someone else in there, you've got to be thinking about this from the eyes of the renter, the guest. And how many times have you ever been in a, you know, a hotel and the air conditioner quit working, right? Or the, it smelled like smoke or uh, the, the toilet didn't work for some reason, or the bathroom. I hope is very few, if any. But remember, those things happen and those things break. And so when you're looking for a property, you need to look to see how renovated, how up to date is it? Because as those things start to break, if they break with your people in them, it's going to be a problem. We we actually started some units in February one year, 2021, and we actually had a freeze in Birmingham. And the apartment complex was like built in the 40s or 50s. They had been recently renovated, but what hadn't been renovated was all the furnaces. And we had like six of the eight furnaces quit working on the coldest day in like 10 years in Alabama. Well, that clearly created a major problem for our guests that were in those units. So looking at those things, things that I wouldn't have even thought about it from the beginning, yeah. make a difference. All right. We got to move on. That's the point number one is where do I find them? So point number two is how do I acquire them? What are the different options? Stallion, what do you believe are some of the um, best ways to acquire short-term rentals in your opinion? 
Uh, so I'll say just from our experience has been arbitrage. And when I say arbitrage, I mean, you're going out and you're negotiating a lease on that property with the current owner. So just not unlike anything else that you've ever leased before, you agree to a monthly amount with that landlord. And you, of course, tell them up front that you're going to be operating the short-term rental business as a uh, sublease kind of situation. And of course, the, the wording is very clear. Our, you know, we can share with you how that actually is supposed to be done. But you're then you're able to turn around and uh, furnish that property and subsequently put it on an Air, Airbnb or VRBO or one of these um, platforms and start renting it. And what you do is you get to keep what's in between what you pay in rent and what you're able to get in revenue. And that's what we've been able to do. Uh, it was something that I feel like helped us to do it fairly quickly and to increase cash flow very quickly. It didn't take as much capital up front because we didn't have to buy the property. We just had to have one month's rent and the furnishings. And so that's that's one strategy I feel like has worked really well for us. Here, I want to back up where I think that's a good point and back up the, the point I made at the very beginning that this may be the most easily accessible passive income strategy to get involved in because there's no because you can have no money. You don't have to have market. All of that equals no problem, right? It <laughs> reminds me of the no no uh, no shirt, no service kind of thing. No shirt, no sho shoes, no service. Well, to me, no money, no market, no problem. Because typically to start a business of any sort, you're going to have to buy equipment. You're going to have to have office space. You're going to have inventory. You're going to have all the marketing employees. It's going to take you three to five years to get the business up and running. And usually about six to seven years to become profitable. I remember my wife started a dental practice. It required over $750,000 in equipment and furnishings and, and the space build out alone. Right. Like that's even before she started paying employees to start working in there before they even brought a dollar in. But yet the short term rental space can be entered in with as little as one month's rent doing what you just talked about, Stallion. That's right. I, I, I know a guy, he was a single father, bad credit. He needed a way to make some extra cash, create a side hustle. He got a short term rental going and he rented everything. <laughs> he rented the apartment. He rented the furniture. He even rented the washer and dryer. There are ways from an arbitrage to get involved. Now, I, I see Matthew over there chomping at the bit. He's like, uh, I don't know about this arbitrage. What, what's the other option, Matthew? Well, obviously, the other option is to purchase the property. Um, you know, when 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 my wife and I were, were looking for our first short-term rental, um, like I said, my, our motivation was to find a vacation home. Well, we didn't want a vacation home that we had to rent. Obviously, we wanted a vacation home that we could have long term. So uh, our our first focus was actually purchasing the property, and we were fortunate to have some some soldiers that were tied up in a in a four hundred one k that we were able to free um, in order to get that purchase. Um, the nice thing though is, especially if you're purchasing in destination markets, is you know since we had the intentions of using the property for ourselves as well, we were able to actually use use it uh, use a second home loan where you only have to put 10% down as opposed to the traditional 20 or 25% for an investment property. So we were able to save that upfront cost. And, uh, and even in the first year, we've already made our initial capital back and then some, so we're, we're playing with house money at this point. So, so uh, there are a lot of ways that you can, even if you don't feel like you have enough money to purchase the property, there are a lot of ways, a lot of strategies from a financing standpoint that, that still can open that door up for you. Man, you guys both have strategies that work, but let me tell you why you're both wrong real quick. <laughs> Joe and Russ, what do you get at the end of your lease? Uh, furniture. When, uh, furniture. Opportunity to renew it. <laughs> furniture. Matthew, I'm totally on board with you. Let's own the property. Let's own the property. Let's, let's let somebody else pay for it. But why don't we buy it, renovate it, then furnish it, then refinance it, and have very little money in the property and own the property. Come on, guys. That's what I did with mine is oh. we just did it like a traditional burr. I cashed out, refied it. Then I took money from that cash out refi to furnish it. And now we're just cooking with gas. 
Oh, you, you're just kind of so rub, you, rubbing our nose in it is basically what you're saying. So you That's rid right. of you you refinance it to get cash, so then you could use that to buy the furniture without having to double down. Ah, absolutely. I, I, I absolutely. like that. Oh, well, what are some of the benefits to owning it, guys? I, I hear you guys uh, talking a little bit. G- give me some more, because from my end, right, like the arbitrage model, little capital. We've already hammered that one. The ability to exit, right? Like we've had units that we did not renew the lease because we were like, this complex is not a good fit. We're not seeing uh, this size unit being rented as frequently as we wanted to. So we were literally at the end of um, 13 months or whatever our lease period was, we we packed up and moved to another spot, right? That was easy. I know we were able to scale it at a, at a pace we never would have been able to. We got to 26 units in like 14, 15 months. And I, I would almost say because of that, it gave us a lot less risk because we could diversify the number of units we had in the number of areas, which then gave us a little bit of room from a volatility standpoint of the occupancy. We weren't stuck to one area. Hmm. I what like about, it. What about you guys? What, what do you feel like the, the benefits of owning are? For me, and Matthew, I want you to jump in here as well. I mean, for me, it's appreciation. I bought this property was in is in an up and coming area of Birmingham. It's only going to get better. I know it's already appraised for more than I have in it, and now it's cash flowing for me. So I I plan on that property appreciating. I love the cash flow. If it appreciates, that's a cherry on top. It's great. But I also get to capture the benefits of owning that property on taxes through depreciation. Um, it's also in an area where I have options if it doesn't work out for a short term rental. I can make it a long-term rental. So for me, it was about the options of the property, but owning the property, they don't make any more property. So I'm going to try and own as much as I can. Yeah, 100%. My uh, my property, my cabin that I bought up in Pigeon Forge over the course of about 18 months, it doubled in value. So it appreciated. I was able to refinance and pull all that extra equity out, which completely, <laughs> which completely gave me a, a huge opportunity to deploy that money elsewhere and even make even more money. But to, to Jamie's point, the depreciation was just as effective because, you know, there's a, there's a little known, unless you're in the short-term rental world, there's a little known exception in the tax code where you can actually apply bonus depreciation against your active income. Uh, you have to do it correctly. Like we emphasized at the beginning, like Jamie emphasized at the beginning, you have to do it correctly because there are rules. But if you follow those rules, like the as the IRS laid them out, you're able to apply that bonus depreciation, get a cost segregation on that property, apply all of that bonus depreciation up front, and you can wipe out. I actually, I actually personally wiped out all of my tax liability um, in 2021 just from that one property. Now, so okay, come was, on. Uh, <laughs> All right, now, hey, look, listen, we had some leases double in value over that same time. I mean, come on, give us some credit. <laughs> hey, here, here, let me one one takeaway from that, right? And I know that we learned this from listening to Tom Wilwright because we had him in our Inner Circle Plus Mastermind recently. If you're not getting these sort of tips. And you don't know where to go to get them. You need to be a part of a money mastermind. So a really easy takeaway right now is to jump on a call, go to wealthwhitewallstreet.com forward slash free call and talk to one of these coaches about the money masterminds that exist and how can you tap into nuggets just like what Matthew said by getting access to the people who can deliver you ideas and strategies that aren't readily available out there for the average person. All right, that's point number two. So point number one was where do we find them? Point number two is how do we acquire them? Now, point number three is how do we operate them? Talk to me, Stallion, about operating a short-term rental. I don't think you or I need to talk about operating anything. We're like the world's worst. So the only thing I can add here is, man, this is a industry that you can hire operators, right? You can outsource the operation of this whole function. And I I highly recommend it because I don't go to sleep wondering if someone's going to, you know, chat me up this evening on how to get into the unit or where the bathroom is or, 
can I get some more towels or any garbage like that? Like where the bathroom is. I mean, you don't know. <laughs> for, dude. for the record, we have no units where we hide the bathroom. Okay. <laughs> Just if you go to wake up in Birmingham.com, you're not gonna find an outhouse anywhere in our in our portfolio. But I, I do agree because I remember Stallion, one of the first people we interviewed on the podcast as it related to short-term rentals, told us that they had they had no intention of getting any more units because they couldn't find the time between uh, washing sheets, um, driving over spatulas you know, to the next unit when they need them, and you know filling the uh, the storage closet with toilet paper. They just had no more need for any more units than the four or five that they had. And I thought, well, crap, that that doesn't seem fun, right? I don't want to do that. But when we realize that you can scale it, you can add key team members, right, Matthew. Who are the key team members that people need to have in order to operate a unit with as little hands-on as possible? The number one most important team member that I have, and I think most short-term rental people, especially people who self-manage, I self-manage my short-term rental and I do it from a, from a distance. I'm three hours away from my short-term rental. The number one key team member is your cleaner. You have got to have a reliable cleaner because they are going to be, not only are they going to clean your cabin, or her property, not just cabin, but property, they have to be, they have to be consistent on the cleanliness so that you have a consistent experience for all your guests. But not only that, they need to be your boots on the ground. So if there's anything wrong with your property, they can immediately let you know, you can immediately address it. Hopefully the timing is where you can address it between guests and you're not having to address it while a guest is in the property. Uh, sometimes you, that's unavoidable, but regardless, 100%. The number one team member is your cleaner. You have to find a reliable cleaner. Jamie, let's dig in a little bit to the tech and the automation part of this. How do we make this as automated and um, work on autopilot as possible? But also, I want to I want to talk about do we need all the tech that's out there? Because there's, you know, there's just tons of the stuff and that really scares Joey when he thinks about spending money. Well, first of all, I just want to say I did get a message this weekend that literally said, is there a trick to flushing the toilet? So um, that you was see, that Russ, was I wasn't that far off, bro. Come weekend. on. Were, were they from like Australia where they're used no, to like no, being on the opposite you know. side and going, <laughs> you know, the toilet water, you know, going counterclockwise or what? I said, you push the little lever thingy, just make sure the the chain isn't disconnected and, and let me know if you have any other issues I didn't hear back. So I'm assuming that, that might have been the issue. But um but no, that's what I love about the short-term rental space is it's so easy to automate it. So if I had to do everything manually, everything would fall apart. I'm just going to go ahead and say it. But there's the tech stack that you mentioned. It makes it so easy to send follow-up messages to your guests. So my guests get automated messages from the time they book until the time they check out. All I have to do is answer random one-off questions. I've automated the cleaning process uh, with a piece of technology. Finding the cleaner is super important, but once you do... You can automate that schedule, link the calendars. It sends an alert to your cleaner. They accept it. You train them on what you're looking for. You can build a checklist. They know what to do every single time when they go in there and knock it out. Um, and then even the pricing, you know, the self-pricing uh, platforms that are out there. So it adjusts automatically based on supply and demand in the area. So I don't have to manually be going in um, and, and adjusting pricing. Now you have to manage all of the systems, right? But overall, it's, it's very, very automated. So it's pretty simple to use. And to your question of, do we need everything? I hate to be like Mark Carducci, but I think it depends. You know, it depends on who your guest is. Um, who's coming to stay at your place? I mean, there's electronic guest books and everything above beyond. I don't personally use that, um, but I think they have a fit in certain locations. Cool. All right, Stallion, we, we've covered, I think as much as we possibly can here. I mean, the goal, through this whole process, as we go through this series of different passive income strategies that we personally have implemented, and gratefully, we have coaches on here who have implemented many different strategies as well, is to break it down, to help you understand where you're going to find these units, how are you going to acquire them, knowing that there's options to all of that, as well as how do you operate. I needed you to give me a final word as we start to wrap this up. I just want to encourage you that if you haven't already taken the process that we lay out for people um, and figure out what, get really clear on what your goals are. 
really clear on what your life will look like when you're financially free. That's the first step. What we're talking about right now is a strategy that will help you get to whatever those goals are, but don't get caught up in, man, STR, short-term rentals, that's what I need to be doing because some, so-and-so is having success with it. That is a nightmare. That is a uh, prescription for failure because you have to make sure that the investment that you're doing supports and will help you get to your goals. So I can't encourage you enough to jump on a call with one of our coaches, go to wealthwithoutwallstreet.com forward slash free call, go through the process, learn what it is that your goal is, build a plan and figure out what investor you are before you implement this. But this is certainly one of um, our favorite strategies that has made a huge impact for a lot of people. Jamie, final thought. My final thought here, and, and this wasn't really brought up, but I know the answer to it is you mentioned jumping off the high dive and, and short-term rental specific. I think everybody on this call has one thing in common when it came to jumping into the pool is, is we paid for education on how to do this, right? We went and learned how to, how to be successful in this, or at least give us the tool set to go out and be more successful than we would have trying ourselves. So I, I think if this is interesting, don't be afraid to get the education you need to take that leap. Hmm. Matthew, final thought. Yeah. Uh, to, to tag on to Jamie's comment, speaking of education, you know, if you haven't joined our community, join our community because believe it or not, we actually have a full blown short term rental course in our community available to anyone. And on top of that, if you if you take that course and you think you need a, an additional help, we have short term rental mastermind that is run by Clint Lovett, and he is phenomenal. If I had been a member of this mastermind and had taken this course prior to my purchasing the short term rental, I probably would be a lot farther along than I am today. But you know, better late than never. But uh, it's it's not too late. So if you are interested in this particular passive income opportunity or any others, join our community. Get 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 involved. Uh, ask questions. Um, we're all available. We're all here to help each other. A hundred percent. Well, Stan, you started it off by saying you need to have a clear vision of what you want, right? Cameron Harold wrote a great book called The Vivid Vision. And when you know what you want, it makes it so much easier to then create a plan to accomplish it. But we also know that it requires access to cash. And so oftentimes these coaches tell me after they've been working with somebody that they were shocked that the individual was shocked that there was money that they had been putting in places that they couldn't access. But with the, just a couple of tweaks, with a couple of tips from these coaches, we're able to unlock dollars that now that they could find the passive income stream. So understanding that there are ways to get access to dollars that you didn't even know were available, these coaches possess that. But just to your point, Joey, if this is your passive income stream that you need. You need help building passive income. The first thing you must do is identify your investor DNA. So then you can start researching the different passive income options that fit that DNA and narrowing it down to one, maybe two, and getting on a call with one of these coaches. They can help you do that. So go to wealthwallstreet.com forward slash free call. As always, we appreciate you listening. If you found value, take time, rate, review the show. We would love to have you sharing this with other people so that they too can get on their journey to becoming financially free. Have an amazing day. This has been the Wealth Without Wall Street podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to the show to break free of the Wall Street mindset and begin building wealth on your own terms in places you understand so that your wealth will never run dry. See you next episode.